morning to one and all. I, Himanshu Thakkar from Team IEEE BMSP, welcomes you to the third session of the International Tech Conclave, ITC 2020. Before going ahead with the session, participants kindly keep a short note. Certificates will be provided to only those who attend all the sessions of ITC. And like the videos and also subscribe at the same time. If you have any questions for the speaker, you can use the chat section and our moderators will forward it to the speaker. Moving ahead today for the upcoming session, we have with us Mr. Venkat Raju, who would be talking about data analytics, trends and the future. Now, I would like to call Dr. Rashish Mehta, sir, Associate Dean III and a senior IEEE member further. I request Dr. Rashish Mehta, sir, please take the proceedings further. I request Dr. Rashish Mehta, sir. I request Rashish in the proceedings. I guess sir is not here with us. I request Dr. Darshal Dalwadi sir to please for take part of the proceeding. So Iman, so just wait for a few minutes or we'll start. Sure, sir. Okay, so good morning to all participants and delegates. So today is our first session. Hello. Yeah. So our today is our third session. So first of all, I welcome our today expert, Mr. Venkat Raju. I'm giving a brief introduction of the sir. Sir is a uh, product management and data science at the University of California, Berkeley. He is highly interested in psychology and the rational and irrational actions of consumers and stakeholders have contributed to his success as a product and key account manager at United Technology CCS. Here, he successfully managed a product lifecycle portfolio of $30 million in business and customized courier and Toshiba air conditioning products. He draw projects for B2B clients in airport, rapid railways, and condominium segments across technology and raised a total of $4.5 million revenue collectively. The unique coursework offered at the University of California, Berkeley has adequately prepared him to immediately define and own the strategy behind products, drive the development, launch, and support of products. As a graduate student, he has learned the essential skills required to successfully manage products and to end. He has participated in several data analytic projects and completed coursework in product management, data analytics, optimizations, and leadership. So on behalf of IEEE BVM, I welcome you, sir, and I hand over the session to Mr. Venkat Raju, sir. Sir, please. Thank you so much. Introduction. Um, so can I proceed and share my screen now? Yes, sir. So, thank you so much. Um, Great. So, hi everybody. Um, this is Venkat Raju, and today we are going to uh, do a small dive into uh, data science. And uh, this is my two cents to this entirely evolving field. 
that's constantly uh, gathering more information, more knowledge. And I'm pretty sure all of you had a certain amount of experience navigating through a couple of videos and a couple of channels. And uh, this is my, as I said, two cents to help you all understand if you're on track or if you have any questions to ask me. And we'll go through the background of data science, a couple of projects that I did, and also where it is intended to go into the future. So um, before we start the session, uh, all of you would have received uh, either on YouTube or on the chat box uh, this link to the poll. And I would like you all to go to this poll link and give me a brief idea of what your background with data science is. So uh, just after a minute, we'll again resume the discussion. Let's give it another 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up the poll now. Awesome. So, so right there is a straightforward example of the power of data analytics and uh, the power of uh, the internet. And I just wanted to display that to all of you and at the same time, understand what the background of the audience is. Um, so let's proceed with the presentation. And from my inference, I think most of you here are curious about the field. Uh, you want to understand what it can offer you and what it's all about and what is the hype all about. And uh, I also understand that most of you are new to the field and I'm going to uh, make sure that you guys feel uh, extremely um, uh, relevant here and you can draw a lot of insights and examples. So let's proceed with the presentation and I'll be happy to take you through my journey and the journey of what data science as a field is. Awesome. So let me introduce myself to all of you. And uh, this is me. Uh, I know I look a little bit sleep deprived, uh, <laughs> thanks to the curriculum here. But I am a master student in industrial engineering and operations research at UC Berkeley. Um, I specialize in the field of data science and product management. And uh, I come with a rich experience of both uh, technical and business skills. Um, I worked, as the introduction said, for around three years uh, in United Technologies for the carrier air conditioning products. And I raised about four and a half million uh, by managing a client portfolio of around 30 million US dollars. Um, while doing the business with United Technologies, I was super curious about um, the field of data science. I wanted to know how different it is impacting uh, the business decisions. And I, I used to work a lot with pivot tables and Excel files, and I wanted to explore more about Python. And I realized the professional degree would definitely give me that edge. So here I am at UBC Berkeley. And I'm doing two projects in data science, uh, one with solar energy field. And I believe you also have a, a discussion with the solar energy expert coming up today. And I also have a project with the Federal Aviation Agency, which is a project uh, to optimize airports uh, in the United States. I 
I'm also currently designing and developing a product uh, of my own, which is an idea of a B2B company and a contracting platform. So my personal journey, yes, of course, all of us have hobbies. Um, I love cats. I love photography. Um, I have done crazy things like uh, hiking the Himalayas twice uh, to 14,000 feet. Um, I love long drives driven straight from Bangalore to Goa. And I have a great passion for ideas and discussing philosophy. So this is my background. I've painted a picture of who it is that is presenting to you. Um, let's go into uh, the flow of the presentation today. I'm going to introduce the topic of data science. It's good that most of you are new to the field. Um, I know you have so many resources out there in YouTube and so many resources out there in uh, LinkedIn and Coursera. And I'm pretty sure I'm happy that all of you do have exposure to that. Let's, let's take this uh, presentation also as uh, a session that can help you go in the right direction. Um, I'm going to then talk about past, the present, and the future of data science. I'm going to address the job market, uh, how it is at present, um, not with respect to COVID-19, but <laughs> otherwise. Um, I'm going to talk about the trends of the uh, industry, the way it's moving, uh, what crazy developments are happening around us. Um, I'm also going to talk to you about uh, resources to learn the field of data science and get started with it. We'll do all of this for around 60 minutes, um, and then we move to the Q&A section. You can type in your questions at that point in the chat box, and the moderators will help connecting them with me. Uh, we'll do the Q&A for about 15 minutes as well. So uh, let's start with a story. I love telling stories, specifically because uh, I think it's a great way to uh, see all of us have a similar experience in life. Um, this, ha this happened, um, so I was working in Bangalore uh, at EDC at United Technologies. And um, there was one weekend that I was super bored and a couple of friends and I decided, let's make it a trip. So we all uh, decided we'll go to offbeat locations, which means uh, we decided to go to Gokarna, uh, typically because it was off season and we thought it would be really silent, less people, um, less prices, uh, you know, less, uh, less cost of stay and everything else. And um, it was great. So we went for the trip. Uh, we came back and we uploaded a couple of pictures on Instagram. Um, like all of us do, we want to share our life. Um, just after we did that, a couple of other friends of mine who did not come on the trip, a different bunch of them, they ended up going to Gokarna as well. And then a couple of distant people in my connections ended up doing the same thing. Um, at some point of time, this got really creepy. I was, I was wondering, um, did I make these decisions all by myself? Did a bunch of friends and I just decided very organically uh, by our own gut feeling that we wanted to go to Gokarna, uh, a place, uh, as a place, as a holiday, or was it influenced by something? Uh, were all of us being influenced by a certain amount of data or an advertisement? Uh, somebody is able to analyze about us, uh, understand that we are a vulnerable audience and project it at us and actually get results out of it. They're able to persuade us to go to Gokarna. Is this possible? Well, um, I hate to admit that, yes, it is possible. And let's go into what data science actually is going to offer all of you. So um, there is quite a bit of uh, doubt about um, what data science exactly is. And I'm here to clear a couple of those questions. Um, but I think there's a small technical glitch in the uh, images here. Uh, is it possible for me to reset that? Just give me a second. I do hope there's no, okay. There's quite a lot of images that are not being displayed. Um, can we pause the session for a minute, please? Um, do I have the moderators here? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just lost a couple of images, so I'm just curious. Okay. 
yeah data science so what exactly data science is is very simply broken down i would say is two parts to it one is science which is about organizing and data itself is going to give you an indication that i'm performing this act on the field of data science so machine learning artificial intelligence and um, deep learning are just few other aspects of data science themselves um they all come as subsets and it gets a little more complicated as you go down the stream so first to address what machine learning is machine learning is nothing but a bunch of computer algorithms that is actually able to decipher what the entire system needs um so it's actually able to do this based on training data it's able to analyze this data set and at the same time it's able to uh do this based on small amounts of data with high accuracy and maybe if you want to be flexible with your accuracy you could go ahead with machine learning algorithms but let's assume you have large amounts of data available with you and you actually want to perform this um and you want to get really deeper and high accuracy levels for example you're applying this to a medical field you have to apply what's called a deep learning algorithm and deep learning algorithms are highly capable of doing that then we look at artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is a lot more complicated and it 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 is kind of similar to deep learning with one extra component to it which is called as a decision interface a decision interface is when the machine is capable of making decisions interacting with the environment based on what analysis it's making and constantly feeding this mechanism back into the picture um i'm so sorry i don't understand why the pictures aren't coming here on the presentation today but um to give you all a general uh, idea so this is basically a venn diagram uh on the left side it talks about how decision data science is actually an inter an, an interlink between all of these multiple fields you have statistics and mathematics uh and then you mix it up with computer algorithms to uh, address it on the data set and then you also have hacking skills so this is ethical hacking i'm not talking about hacking uh, the system unethically and why does hacking come into picture because data science data sets aren't a part of real life you have to scrape them out of various websites you have to visit many um you know legally you have to scrape them out of various companies apis and you call this a little bit of hacking that you need to do. so this is exactly where data science sits in between so to move on to the next slide we are looking at a little bit of the journey of data science from the past so how has the field exactly shaped up to where it is um yeah again i'm not able to exactly pull you guys pictures i have no clue why um i'm so sorry about this confusion issues here but um the field of data science evolved from quite some time back so this is a picture of um, a french engineer so he pa he painted a beautiful image of uh, how the napoleon's army kind of lost battle in various locations during the russian um, campaigns so this was back in 1812 when the war happened and in 1861 this french engineer actually drew these images and he did, this is the first image that talked about what is called a tableau and uh, the word tableau comes from from there and this is right now used a lot so think of for machine learning and data science to actually evolve out of a human psychology so when i talk about psychology i would say um, at times when you had kings and the times when you had uh, a smaller family or large kingdoms uh, people felt safer if they had more information so they needed to have information about how to keep themselves alive uh which places had more resources for water and food which places were safer uh, which kingdoms were better um and where is the medicine available in the in the forest so the more information somebody knows the better lifestyle they live and this is the same concept that people of over the ages used uh until this millennium uh, when they're just looking at digitizing data and using digital data to give ourselves more information so the journey starts in 1816 1861 as you documented a lot of books and research work goes into it and and 1960s you have a lot of development in the field of database management systems what database management systems are is basically data stored in multiple locations how they can be linked to each other and accessed and when this grew over the decades um, you had in 1998 9 in 2001 several statisticians coined the word uh, data science and in, as an independent field and they decided to give themselves a very fancy term uh to actually call themselves data scientists instead of statisticians uh and this comes brings us to where we are right now with machine learning algorithms and um uh, i i can quickly take you through um another case study uh oh god this is a lot of pictures that are missing oh god okay 
Um, so sorry, I'm unable to show you folks a lot of images. I don't know how to really fix this. Uh, it just makes me really curious to get this fixed right now. Give me a second, please. I'm just going to quickly share the screen again. I'm really sorry for the hiccup, guys. So this one's on me. OK, uh, I hope you all can see the screen again. Uh, we're just quickly taking it through um, presentation. So yeah, uh, this was the Venn diagram I was talking about, just for clear visual uh, perspective. Um, and we're going to quickly move through the other slides uh, that we have reached. Talked about the past. So this was exactly the picture. It's kind of beautiful how it looks. Um, you have this French engineer who basically uh, came up with this concept. So it's actually a geographical map of the entire location that they fought the battle. And it's been scaled down and plotted against a graph, which is at the bottom of the image. Yeah, so this is really fun. Uh, if most of you have a slight exposure to data science, the first and foremost thing you would have done is taken a couple of exercises on wine data. And this happened. So a um, professor from Princeton University uh, of Economics, uh, his name is Orle Ashenfelter. So what he did was uh, he revolutionized what is called the wine tasting department. And um, mostly what happens in wine tasting is you have experts who actually predict which wine is going to be vintage. And uh, they actually have a certain amount of skills and it's an art. They treat it very, very sacred. Um, so what the Princeton professor did is he said, hey, you know what? I don't really need to taste the wine, but I can tell you which is vintage. And he did this entirely from his analysis on data science. And how did he achieve that? He used what is called the simplest form of linear regression. And linear regression gave him the entire um, ability to actually take data from the harvest of the rain from the winter rainfall in millimeters and certain other important parameters to plot them against a graph. And when he did this, he was able to predict based on the, the date of manufacture of the wine, which would be vintage and sold at a very, very high price. Um, by doing this, he actually claimed himself to have killed the industry quite a bit and out of, for which he was not super happy. Uh, because initially, uh, when the wine tasters were against him, they ended up being super accurate in the future. And he felt that he actually destroyed a lot of that authenticity of someone's predictions by not actually doing the math behind it. But it's a great example of what data science has done to the field. And this is an example from the past. And the journey to what the data science aspect of things are at present. This is a quick uh, view of how many people use the internet as of the last couple of years in a decade. Uh, so if you look at the graph, we are at, at this point over last year of 2019, 53% of the world is on the internet. And that's almost of about 4 billion in population. So if you look at, it correlates with the uh, total percentage of almost those who have mobile devices. You have 68% of the world that uses them. You have 53% out of which are actually having access to internet. Now, this is alarming because um, we still have 20% of the population that still goes hungry to bed. While that problem is happening on the side, there is this huge boom of internet usage and the penetration of internet in the market is a lot more severe than food security. And this is really interesting to watch. Uh, and that talks about how important information has become over what is food and water and air. 
So at the present stages, where we are uh, in terms of data and science and machine learning, is this simple model uh, of graph that talks to you about uh, three different aspects of data and analysis of data. So the first one I would say will be unsupervised learning. A uh, typical unsupervised learning uh, is when you do not tell the machine what you want it to classify the data as, which means the machine is free to do it, but it has to figure out a pattern in the data. And this is typically an example of clustering where the machine figures out that these customers belong to a certain segment. These are high class customers, low paying customers and things like that. When you talk about supervised learning, you feed in the machine a data set with predetermined classifiers and you tell them I have classifications of one to 10 and I want to categorize my customers only in these 10 classifications. So the next time I feed in data about a certain customer's input, it should tell me which class he belongs to. Is he a scale of, on a scale of 10, is he belonging to number eight, number seven, is he as bad as one and things like that. Um, and this is where regression also comes into picture because you're already feeding in the model a certain pattern that it needs to follow and understand and interpret. Uh, reinforcement learning is another concept that is about certain examples in the field of gaming and AI. Uh, so reinforcement learning is constantly feeding a machine uh, the idea that the output is highly determined by a certain incentive. So you set a few success criteria and you tell the machine, please achieve the target output with the least time taken or least distance traveled and incentivize this process so that the machine keeps getting feedback and improving upon itself going forward. And this is a typical example in games, right? How games are done. Um, so to talk about real world examples, uh, this slide is going to take quite some time because we have quite a few examples to talk about fraud detection. So a lot of banks uh, and credit card companies uh, have the ability right now, thanks to machine learning, to quickly classify if a certain transaction that was registered on their website or on their portal, whether it's really true or is it false? And there's a lot of pressure on them and then the machine learning models to be very accurate because they have to reduce the number of false positive cases. And um, this also applies to the field of social media. Social media, or let's also call it uh, a place where most of us share our thoughts. Social media is great because you have lots of data coming in from the individuals where we talk about putting a post about how we feel. So somebody has data about how somebody feels a lot, right? And at the same time, there's a lot of metadata. So what, what I mean by metadata is data that is not very direct, but data that you eventually end up doing anyway for the companies. Facebook gets data about your locations. They get data about the time that you post something. And all of this contributes to something called a meta metadata or a peripheral data that's very outside the ecosystem, but still useful to other companies that they can use. Um, so the recent another update is that Twitter has basically come up with another uh, technique. So this, they really identified that by analyzing person's posts on Twitter, they can predict if somebody is high at high risk of heart attack or not. Uh, there's, a, there's a been a good correlation between someone's using the word hatred uh, to determine somebody having uh, heart disease in the future. Uh, this is super interesting to see. Uh, unfortunate, but yeah, super interesting. Um, and then you talk about uh, climate change, right? Uh, so climate change or uh, talking about weather predictions. Uh, most of the time we rely on weather predictions to understand what kind of clothes we need to pack if we go on a trip uh, or whether do we have a uh, college or do we have school? Uh, it's going to rain a lot. Uh, is it going to happen? And out of this, uh, we can understand whether predictions accuracy improves and improves over the years, uh, thanks to the fact that machine learning models can actually improve accuracy as they get more data inside. So they start analyzing a pattern in the way that time series or a certain algorithms work in that support machine learning. So these are the quite a few uh, real life examples. A fun example, of course, would be dating platforms or a matrimony site. They're taking data about your personality, your likes and dislikes, and they're trying to uh, cluster people uh, into a certain category and try to match them with one another and see how people respond and is it a successful match? Are people actually taking it forward into a relationship and maybe are they actually getting engaged and married? And these are some important data sets to analyze people's personalities. So this is an interesting slide again. And why I would say that is because I'm giving you my two cents about two extreme ends of data science capabilities as of today. Um, so the first one about linear regression is giving you a graphical idea with an image that's on the top talking to you about a commander's potential plotted against his IQ score. 
So it's talking about how well somebody performs in the field based on their IQ scores. So this is a regression line that's being fitted across these data points. And that's the, and the dotted lines that are joining towards the line is actually the amount of error or deviation from the actual line. If you notice the prediction errors, as you actually start plotting the line a lot better, the prediction errors get flatter. They actually uh, average out across a specific median score itself. So this is a typical example of how regression, which is a simpler form of uh, analytical models and regression works. And um, on the right hand side, you see something called an artificial neural network. It's a favorite to a lot of data science companies. Uh, it's a favorite to a lot of people right now. Um, so artificial neural networks as a quick introduction has quite a lot of um, past to it. So it was highly, highly booming during the 1960s to 1980s. And the reason that artificial neural network is picking up buzz just now is thanks to the development in the field of computer science and, and, and all the computations that are possible uh, with increasing memories and storage and data centers and stuff. Uh, earlier, the research work was only happening, but people could not, could not run those many algorithms and they could not achieve a certain amount of scores and test if their mathematics was perfect or not. So this research had to stop. But right now, uh, let's look at uh, the image. So on the top image, which is in black, um, this is an artificial neural network projected to typically make you understand how image processing works. So the cell on top is holding our image of seven right now. And all the 784 pixels that are actually arranged in a vertical line, let's call them neurons. So all the circles are called neurons just to mimic the same way as our human body works in the biology itself. Um, each of these neurons are linked to the uh, other hidden layers, as we call the layer two and layer three. And the layer, the final hidden layer is connected to the output that we actually desire to bring. So each of these neurons can actually hold a value which is called as the activation number. And the activation number is a value between zero and one. And these numbers possess the degree to which a certain pixel is lit which is whether it is on or off, and what is the degree of intensity of light. Um, so there, all of these nodes are connected to each other based on a certain amount of weightage. And initially, all of these weightages are randomized. All the hidden layer values and numbers are randomized. And when I feed the first ever training image, uh, the model basically tries to predict an output. Let's say we pass seven, but it ends up predicting five. So we set a certain amount of success rate and we try to plot the error and back propagate how this entire neural network works. So there are two propagations here. One is called friend propagation, where the model is taking in a value and it has to bring us a value one. And if in case that doesn't happen, let's say we give the model a beating and we say, hey, you go back out there and fix all the mistakes that you did. So it does a certain form of back propagation and it actually goes and readjusts the weight. And you can see that mathematical um, backpropagation happening at the bottom as well in green and different colors. Once it does that, it, it keeps doing this pattern back and forth. And this is exactly how uh, neural networks achieve what they do. And just to end with a quote that people say in biology, pretty much, uh, all of this is inspired from human uh, beings, right? Or how we understand the field around us. Uh, so biology says this, um, neurons that fire together, wire together. So when when I say number seven there, all the neurons that actually turn green are actually connected to each other. And that's exactly how the model of you know, neural networks work. The reason I spend so much time right now on this specific neural networks is because this is the actual error right now. So when you look at the next development in the field of data science right now, which we have, is big data. And why do we have big data? Because it's very simple. Um, we saw the number of people who are using the internet. And if you have a 4 billion population that's on the internet every day, and there's a certain amount of new data that somebody's constantly producing, just by the simple act of you texting someone on WhatsApp, or just by you going and liking a photo on Facebook, or sharing a post on Instagram, is all going to create fresh data for a firm. Uh, and imagine the amount of data they need to keep processing in the back end for this. There are certain big tech companies like Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and IBM has been a very, very old player. 
in the field of data science and modeling. They've been part of it right from uh, database management system, DBMS, and developing a lot of softwares around this field. And uh, these companies vouched to say that um, sales and marketing, which is the key backbone of every company, and if there's no sale, there's never a company, right? A sale is a very important part of a company. They say that the sales and marketing has changed so much because of the use of big data and analytics in big data. And all of these companies say the same thing. What classifies something to be a big data? So there are four different categories for that. And I think most of the pictures here are kind of self-explanatory. The first one is volume. So volume just simply means nothing but how much stationary data do I hold on any specific basis? And this is basically a data explosion issue because you have data growing to almost 175 zettabytes by 2025, and this is going to keep increasing and increasing quite a lot. Um, when you talk about the next point, which is variety, variety of data comes in because of various forms of applications you create. Right? Uh, in Facebook itself, you have all of these applications, all of these quantities possible. You have text, you have image, and you have uh, quantities, basically number of likes, number of shares, uh, number of comments, some deletes, and things like that. And structural so data is basically if data is structured or is it unstructured, do I have to structure it and then analyze it? And source of data is also important because it can come from multiple places. It can come as junk, it can come as from public portal, it can come from a very internal system of your own company. Um, so it would be important to see how authentic the data is based on its source. So this is the variety of data we have. Velocity talks about how fast is my data being replenished? How quickly is my data flowing in and out? And veracity, on the other hand, talks about how much um, um, how, how, how much noise is actually part of the data set, right? So if you look at the diagram there, it gives you a clear indication. Somebody is moving the cursor to increase the smoothness of the data, which means he's removing all the noise and is actually trying to observe an actual pattern in the data and actual trend line across which the data is moving. And this is important to know because if we need to understand how, how what is the rhythm of our error, how many errors are actually happening in our processing of data and where we can get that. So these four components actually add on to what's called big data and this is how we classify it. I've done a couple of projects and I'll be talking to you a lot more about it in that place. Um, so these are the two projects that I am currently working on in the space of big data. And um, I'm using a lot of algorithms here that are pretty complicated. Uh, but I would love to take you through um, the first project, which is called Lumen. Uh, Lumen is actually a company in the US. It's a startup. Um, we are partnering with them from California, Berkeley, and we are supporting a certain way of um, helping uh, companies and builders and analyze if they can convert their entire building to solar energy. And we want to show them that this conversion actually can produce them a lot of savings uh, on top of their overheads that they will spend or capital that they will spend. And when is their return of investment going to come? Um, so to do all of that, we need machine learning models, right? So the data set that we have right now is about a lot of energy data uh, of various buildings across uh, the Berkeley campus. And we are running this right now at Berkeley. Uh, we have about 1.5 million rows of data. And we are using models like Arima, time series analysis, neural networks to actually predict data that's of power consumption that's going to happen in the future. And based on the future consumption of power that we predict, we want to then compare how much uh, energy in solar quantities is the building going to receive, and will that be, be able to keep? Will that building be capable of replacing the current usage uh, with the solar energy conversion? Um, so this is the project, and you can see a couple of images here. Of course, I had to uh, morph them because uh, of NDA issues. I have non-disclosure agreement issues. Uh, similarly, for the project on the right, because it's a government project. So the project on the right is a lot more ambitious. It's a project with the Federal Aviation Agency, which is um, just like the Airport Authority of India. It's, it's the Federal Aviation Agency for the United States. Uh, and the FAA has the capabilities uh, to actually reduce the amount of losses they face uh, because of power shutdowns and lightning strikes and so many other things that cause delays and cancellation of airports and airlines. So they came up to us and they said, we need to actually help and convert a lot of our equipment to higher safety standards. So they have a limited budget. They can't go around protecting all the equipment. So they need to have 
a certain amount of clarity of which equipment in which airport I need to actually go and give a protective casing or it's called fortification uh, in the airport language. So it's again a 10.5 million rows of data. We had to use uh, several platforms. I use Tableau here for visualization. Uh, you could see the visualization at the bottom from Tableau. Uh, so the uh, these are all the equipment names uh, of, of a specific airport, which I can't name. Uh, so they are listed across a timeline analysis. So what we did was we took uh, a gap analysis of every outage followed by the other based on all the unscheduled outages, which means there was a strike or there was uh, some kind of a rainfall issue and then the equipment went out because of which uh, the airport could not conduct the uh, the landing or the flying of an air aircraft well and some there was a delay. So we had to do that and we plotted this against a time increasing time graph. And based on the model analysis, you see two clusters, which is blue and orange. Uh, so the blue clusters are basically those which are highly susceptible to an early outage. And so we knew that these are the cluster of equipments we need to focus on in this airport. Um, this is typically the project which uh, which involved a lot of um, scraping of data, uh, going back and forth on which uh, features were important, which which could be removed. Uh, so it, it's it's crazy because it, 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 you think at some point of time that your results are accurate, but you can always add better data sets to it and improve the model constantly. So uh, this is a quick background to you folks about the project that I'm doing here. So the Epidemics is a very, very interesting uh, because of right now of the situation that we all are in. Um, you must have heard of this term quite often, right? Flatten the curve, please flatten the curve and support our hospitals and stuff like that. Um, the jargon that they've coined uh, and thanks to how it's marketed is because of data science. Uh, uh, most of us realize that if we stay indoors and if we stay hygienic, uh, we will help protect this rising curve and it can actually flatten out over a period of time. So the reason I have Bill Gates here is because I'm pretty sure you must have seen this forwards on WhatsApps and Facebooks. Um, this man is pretty crazy. He reads about a 50, he reads 50 books a year and he has done enough research by himself. He's like a walking machine model. Um, he, out of his research, he predicts that virus is actually the biggest threat and attack to human population back in 2015. And that's exactly why I have him here. And I think you must check his TED talk if you haven't. Um, Please go through it. And uh, for all of you, I have an interesting uh, video that I would like to play now. Um, let's let's quickly give it a watch. This is going to talk to you about the power of data science and the ability to actually uh, run different scenarios and see how certain epidemic can die or rise over time. So let's spend the next six minutes on this presentation on the video. I hope your audio from the video is actually uh, coming up. No, sir. Actually, we are not able to audio, sir. So, if it's oh, possible, okay. can you just... Sure. I can already recite. So, what's happening on the video is he's actually turning on a central location from which people can go and access um, vegetables and things like that. So, here are three different scenarios. One is about controlling how many people go to the central location. Second is social distancing and having a no central market. And fifth, third one is actually having social distancing, but a continued market visit. So it talks about how the curve will look like when we run the simulation and prediction of even the probability values. So here he's reducing the shopping rate by one fifth for each person. And on the right he's reducing the infection rate by half by saying that people are going to be a lot more um, hygienic and they will actually not 
have any uh, issue with you know coronavirus so he's actually reduced and he's comparing how both the graphs look and he's saying that uh, the outcome of this if you observe has a pretty similar similar um, graph right the, the slope is pretty similar which means by cutting shopping rate by one fifth or by actually asking people to please be more hygienic has pretty similar effect and um, he talks to you about how both of them are not necessarily uh, one one condition or the other but have both so it's a pretty cool video so i think um, moving forward he's actually going to basically incorporate all of these three parameters in a different scenario so he's talking about how fluctuating shopping frequency infection rate or the social distancing factor can contribute to a much lesser curve and quick death of the disease over time and um, yeah so these are multiple scenarios that he's running the second case on the right he talks about how if you identify and isolate people uh, it actually helps in improving basically quarantine those people who are deceased actually protects those who still go to a central shopping location and come but come back home is it and contact tracing is something that our government is actually doing pretty well in india i think uh, they are identifying all people who have been in contact with a specific uh, covid case and they're actually removing them from uh, their homes and quarantining them as well so here he is going to play a lot more with social distancing as a factor so he's cutting down travel rate all of these are talking about different hubs and here each box represent a different locality let's assume he's increased his travel rate and he's uh, now saying that let's assume people can still travel between locations it will just cause a second wave of so of coronavirus that's not really going to die down he said even if first time you're successful and you just don't have any measures around there's the possibility of a second wave coming into picture so this is the capacity of machine learning it actually gives you the ability to watch how things work even before they happen uh by running prop randomized models uh giving them random probability values uh it's highly possible to actually observe and keep ourselves safe and keep ourselves sound and this is because of machine learning and the interference of machine learning with uh a present day living so uh let's stop the video there and let's proceed with the other parts of the presentation so we just quickly saw uh, the ability of uh machine learning to help and keep all of us safe like i promised you in the promo this is exactly um how machine learning helps and this is the reason why most of the quarantine um this is the reason why i think even right now in the us they've increased the quarantine time to end of may um and and people don't complain now that we have data to prove it people stop complaining and if there was nothing to prove i think that's when people could really so um let's proceed with the next slide this is a quick knowledge check so you have a lot of this data available over the years people have done so much research and it all falls into just seven steps that every person in the field of data science follows and the seven steps are listed to you out here it starts from data collection through various channels that you have and you push this data into the data preparation stage where you have to do a lot of um, filtering data cleaning data and then you pass it on to the modeling stage uh, modeling training and evaluation happen as a loop it's continuous it keeps happening and until and unless you get a good result and then you find your parameters and you start playing with them to see can i remove a certain parameter in my data set and can i feed it back again and finally we do the prediction once you're satisfied with the model so out of these seven steps uh which step do you think takes most time and feel free to drop in your responses uh in the chat and i will ask the moderators to pick uh the step number that people say most frequently and let me know take about the next 10 to 20 seconds to answer that
Okay, do we have any responses, uh, moderators from the chat box? Sir, uh, actually, there's a delay of 20 seconds on YouTube, so just kindly wait. A bit. Oh, got it. Awesome. Sure, got it. Sure. So, you can refer the chat section. I'm sending the responses given by the audience. Okay. Um, so, uh, if, if most of you have chosen option two, that would be the right answer. Uh, the, the hardest part and the step that takes most time uh, for any companies, uh, any firms is to actually prepare a data set. And trust me when I say this, uh, out of the two projects that I have done, I'm sorry, out of the two projects that I have done, um, if we had a timeline of around five months to report results, we spent four months on just cleaning our model and cleaning us, or sorry, cleaning the data set and actually figuring out if our data set was perfect or do we need to fine tune it more? Do we need to uh, add more um, elements in the data set before we run the model or not? So the first and foremost thing is to actually prepare and clean data that takes most time. It's because now we have automation that can come into picture, right? The running the models, training the models, they can, they can be automated. You can just plug and play with a lot of uh, functions that perform random forest or uh, you know uh, neural networks. Uh, it's all about you know, spending that much time even now manually to intuitively fine tune the data to the product that you require. Very simple example again. Let's assume that Instagram takes data. They take data about when you post the picture, what pictures you post, what you type in the comments, and uh, let's say how many likes or heart signs that you leave per day for every picture or a number of pictures that you see. Um, if they are trying to build another product or a feature on Instagram that it requires only certain specific of these data points. They don't really need to collect all the other stuff, right? So they need to really need to fine tune to what uh, product they're trying to build. So uh, this is exactly where data preparation becomes a very manual, uh, a very um, self uh, company goal driven result. And that's where people spend most of the time. So moving forward, the future and why is it important? Right? Uh, a lot of us would love to know whether we're going to be in a safe hands or not when we're trying to explore a specific field. Uh, we want to know what's the trends of this field, uh, how do I get up, up to speed with it, how can I keep track of what's happening around me. Um, let me be rest assured that this is an amazing field to be in. You are in the safest hands uh, thanks to uh, you know, a lot of statisticians and hard work that they've done uh, in the last century. Uh, so we have uh, quite a lot of work uh, to be done if you really are interested in this specific space. Uh, but a lot of companies like Harvard and uh, New York Times and all of these firms have talked to us saying that this is the hottest field, sexiest job of the 21st century. And uh, all of this is possible uh, because of the potential of generating more data and requiring a lot of human intervention in this process. A clear example would be the recent case of um, Tamil Nadu's government uh, requesting for a data science and analytics uh, board by partnering with HCL. Uh, they wanted to set this up as a disaster management uh, situation. And this is going to keep happening throughout the world. It's going to keep happening in every single industry. Uh, a lot of companies uh, are actually growing their professional requirements of data scientists, right? Uh, the graph here on the right is segmenting and talking to you about the various aspects of a data science or a data scientist that he can take up a role in. You can take up role in data management. You can work in um, DBMS uh, through Hadoop. You can work on SQL. You can work on analytics side of data science itself, which is basically visualization and other things. Um, all of these fields are expected to grow, and they are continuously growing. So you are in specifically safe hands when I say this field is, uh, you know, at a revenue of about eighty uh, billion US dollars currently worldwide. So. How can you find your space in this place? So you need to basically look uh, at a few challenges that the space has first, know these factors, and then let's look at how we can do it. Some challenges uh, that I noticed over the last couple of years uh, when I started moving in this field, uh, like I said, there are three different categories. I would say the first one is effects on a person, right? How does data science affect an individual? How can all this random amount of generation of data um, impact a person's life? It can persuade someone, 
I gave you a clear example of how my in my own life I felt at some point that I was not making organic decisions and I probably am being influenced quite a lot. Uh, data has the ability to do that. They, they can segmentize you as a vulnerable customer. They can uh, they can segmentize you as somebody who uh, who is not a good uh, you know customer to a firm and maybe never reach you out. Uh, they may not offer you a credit card service. There's so many things that can happen. Then second part is effects on a community, group of people. It's possible um, that through various research and, and analysis of models, I understand that a specific group of people uh, will not be supportive of my company's venture. And I might never launch the product there. And thereby denying a lot of, uh, let's say, a basic right, let's say, to pure drinking water or uh, transportation or electricity to all of these factors also. Effects on society is something that most of us need to watch out for because data science and trends have the ability to actually set fashion trends. Um, they have the ability to uh, pro, you know, publicize fake news. And this is typically what happened quite a bit in uh, the recent issue of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. They use a lot of personal data to target uh, audience who will actually end up voting for Donald Trump um, and actually anti-campaigning for other people as well. Uh, what about war? I mean, it's highly possible to actually motivate people to fight for a cause, right? Uh, these are some things we need to really watch out for. There's a TED talk that I saw a couple of months back. Uh, it's called The Dark Side of Data. And the, he raises, uh, the person in the TED talk, uh, whose name I don't really remember now because it's been a couple of months, but he raised a specific question. So he said, uh, wouldn't self-determination be a very important aspect of information? Uh, Europe has extremely... Uh, strict measures about uh, having a right to information. An individual can actually uh, file request to any company and request for all the information that they have about him and provide this and actually terminate all the information if the person wants it. Uh, a lot of other companies must move in that direction. He talked about how this self-determining factor is actually the key to feeling secure and ensuring we don't get manipulated. Um, we're talking so much about artificial intelligence. To not be swept away by the tide of data science, it's important to have real intelligence. Uh, come on, so the more you focus on building a machine's intelligence, let's also focus on sharpening our own brains, sharpening how we understand a machine's working, and also focus on this new wave because uh, I don't think we need to be consumed by it. And there's a lot of issue of privacy for sure. How do we deal with it is to actually help and educate people and set tight up uh, you know, restrictions on how data can be publicized or used. There's a lot of ethical integrity that really needs to be taught to people. Basically meaning, if I sign a contract with a company saying you can use my data for your product, the data can never skip and leave the company and I cannot end up getting calls from health insurances or I can't end up getting calls from any other, uh, you know, insurance firms or medical industries or, or advertising companies and that's exactly not that's not fair. I have not signed up for that, right? Um, so we need to be completely aware of what all partnerships the specific firm has. And this is about ethical integrity. The tighter these laws get, the better it is for us because it's inevitable to move in the way of data science. So how do you navigate through your resources? I wouldn't expect any of you to actually have a um, great amount of knowledge right now because you seem to say you have uh, you know, uh, you're having curiosity, you have a certain amount of background knowledge about what it can offer you. Um, so I'm going to give you my two cents from my personal experience, how I built my competence in this domain. The wave diagram on the left is what exactly I want all of us to feel like. I don't want us to be like the professional in the previous picture. Let's be riding the wave. Let's be taking charge of the situation. Human beings and machines have uh, a long relationship. Uh, machine is not just something that can, is not electronically connected. I would call even uh, the wheel invention a machine. And ever since uh, we were born and even as cavemen, we made sharpening tools. I would say our dependence on machines increased right from that stage. It's a never ending process. The machine needs you to understand, to become a better model. Um, it needs more data from human beings. To, uh, for increasing its predictive capacity, while the humans require the machine to make better decisions as well. It's a never-ending loop, and the process of learning data science does not end. It's like a field of medicine. You, uh, I'm not sure if how many of you are aware of what's, what's a CME. 
it's actually continued medical education and uh, these are just generally points which are awarded to several doctors based on how i know how frequently they keep updating their knowledge in the field of medicine and i'm super confident and i feel uh, it's it's going to come up even for the field of data science it's becoming inevitable trust me when i say this uh, coming from uc berkeley and i can literally see a wave of data science no matter which department you are part of whether you are in metallurgy whether you are in mechanical um, bio or whether you are in industrial like me every department has a flavor of data science as attached to it every company that's recruiting requires you to have uh, minimum knowledge in visualization and uh, querying in sql and um, it, it it's just crazy because this is the current way of they all need you to be sound about how you can make decisions in your day to day professional life and um, to give you uh, a few courses and tools that i used and i would love to recommend to all of you you are not new to any of the names here but my key and foremost a uh, useful online resource i found was coursera because of the tailored content from several universities and certifications they provide but but the certifications alone are not valid and you know and they are not alone um, the key to actually being more comfortable with the field do projects um there are projects associated with a couple of courses but why don't you just take up projects by yourself there's a great resource uh, called kaggle uh, if you are interested in data sets they kind of customize data sets for you people put up projects sometimes they put up results of what they analyzed to the data set download data sets play with them and when i say play with it just do anything possible with it put them in all these tools that you can see here in the list on excel on python or sql and hadoop and tableau just play with them for about a couple of hours a day see what you can project and bring out of them uh in terms of improving your level of competence i would say level 1 would be excel uh using pivot tables um understanding macros and functions in excel go into python simultaneously uh but if you, if you touch base with python i would not highly recommend r but you could still touch base r if you have the time um then more ahead with hadoop it is important for accessing uh many uh, information across several monitors and computers connecting with a network of data sets and then go into visualization through tools like tableau uh, and python so the field of understanding data science doesn't end with just going through courses and doing projects you have to be up to date with reading people's um, articles uh, or let's say or going through webinars there are just like the way you're attending this free webinar and it's a great opportunity for all of you uh, there are a few webinar sessions that thinkful as a as a website offers you if you could just sign up there uh read articles from a really well um uh, professional websites that have personal content from many people like medium and forbes um and the video that i showed you from the animation earlier of the covid 19 is actually from this uh youtube page called three blue one brown it's a wonderful page and this is one of the my my most favorite when it comes to understanding calculus mathematical models or data science neural networks and the beautiful part about his content on youtube is it's it does not have uh, you know it is really boring background music or it does it, he's very simple at his explanation he can break down everything for you please subscribe to the channel i'm not promoting him i'm not here to promote it but it's great content trust me when i say that keep uh, you know going to useful content even on tedx um in terms of movies i would say please make this entire process fun uh if you have not caught up on all these movies which i have listed here these are my most favorite and transcendence stands out as one of the most uh, the best movie that i have seen because um you know not because i don't like isaac asimov and his concepts um it's mostly because i really like the um the transcendence aspect of uh, how he showed machine learning and what ai can do and um It, it's great. I think you you guys have to see that Johnny Depp is a part of the movie. Uh, it's wonderful. So make this entire process fun. Uh, that's what I would say. Um, there are a lot of certifications and other things which you can do, and uh, you can get this off Google. And I really don't have any specific preference because so far uh, I have uh, in the job market not seen certifications play a very big role. People are more and more curious about the projects that you do because that literally gives them an idea of how practically. applicable your skill sets are over 
how many courses and certifications you've completed. People are flooding with a lot of certifications right now on LinkedIn, which is good. I'm happy that all of you made me also looking at it. Uh, but please keep your projects alive. Tableau has a great uh, public portal where you can actually uh, do your projects and visualizations, build dashboards and share it with the public forum. Uh, the more you build your portfolio, just like LinkedIn on Tableau, it's going to be very useful to publicize your background. There. So three blue, one brown is actually a great resource. Please do go through that as well. So um, UC Berkeley also has a resource for you. They have an online uh, master's program, which they offer, which does not require a GRE score. Uh, and this is a website you can go to. It's called Data Science at Berkeley. And it's offered by the School of Information. Uh, it's a master's degree with certification. And you can, you can get all the materials. And you will actually be having face-to-face -face live classes. Um, so for more information on this, you can just type this Data Science at Berkeley uh, in Google and explore this option as well. Um, so I would just love to acknowledge some people uh, like my professors at Berkeley and of course all the other portals that I used um, for the, uh, the analysis of uh, this presentation and also for any other education that's provided me. Of course, Google is the king of it all. Um, but so this is me. Uh, feel free to hit me up um, on this website of California Berkeley. You'll find me there. You can also find me on this email address, on LinkedIn, and on Instagram. Please feel free to subscribe to all these portals, and I'll be happy to add you and answer any further questions moving forward from this webinar as well. So I'm open to Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to leave them in the chat box, and I'll have the moderators uh, announce them to you. Shall we announce or shall we sign the question? Maybe that will be good enough. Don't worry about it. Great, sir. So we'll be sending the questions one by one. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the first question I see is from Harsh Kumar. So he's asking me uh, to what extent should we learn SQL and does basics of it help us to handle data? So there is no specific uh, <laughs> answer to say uh, what extent is enough. That's the trickiest part about data science. The deeper you keep diving, the more you figure out that it's useful. Uh, a lot, but I can say one thing, uh, for a lot of companies that hire you, uh, they would not be expecting you to have very deep level knowledge unless you're uh, doing lateral hiring, which is you're moving in from a different company to another company and you're expected to have data science background. Um, but in terms of um, depth of having SQL knowledge, there's no specific stop point. I would say, um, I, even right now, even I'm spending time to understand uh, how far I need to get, uh, but there's just no way to do that. You just have to keep doing projects. Uh, just don't think of all of this to be with a dead end. None of this has dead end. It's, it's like continued education. Uh, just enjoy the process of learning and using many languages and querying languages. So um, the next question would be, uh, What does data science, how does data science work in automated chips? Um, I'm not sure what automated chips exactly mean here. Um, I'm not sure where exactly that comes from. Um, so I, I would say uh, if you're talking about automation, uh, I, I can just bring in automation as a topic. Um, it's very simple. If you think about uh, automation in the field of um, self-driving cars, uh, Google is doing quite a bit of um, uh, great efforts in that front. Uh, you have some um, exceptional work happening. Uh, Google, Google actually said this, right? They have this specific um, uh, you know, computer that can dream. And they call this entire phenomenon as in inceptionism, uh, whereby they fed a neural network a certain image, trained it on that specific image, and they came back uh, you know, to, uh, they fed a different kind of image afterwards. And the, the, the algorithm was actually able to produce a certain kind of a dreamy uh, kind of uh, smoked image of the previous model. Uh, they call this a certain way of machine dreaming, which is a very fancy way of saying it, but it just simply means 
uh, the machine has a capacity to remember. So just like human beings, when we look at objects around us and we say that we remember it and in our dreams, we have a very distorted version of that. Sometimes you could dream of, uh, you know, an elephant in the sky. It's because you know what a sky is and you know what an elephant is. The same thing that the model has done apparently. So it, it kind of um, went through uh, what the previous image was and projected the previous image in the next training data that it received. Um, this is a really interesting. It's called Inceptionism. And uh, it's the same like the movie Inception, uh, but it is an ism in the end. Uh, please feel free to type it on Google and just read through the articles. It's kind of crazy. Um, what's the next question that I have? Sure. So how is machine learning different from AI? Um, so like I explained earlier, uh, machine learning actually is, um, in simple terms, it's, it's mostly to do with models and algorithms. So machine learning is something that's at the back end of what an artificial intelligence is all about. So artificial intelligence is like an interface. So you're looking at a, a robot or let's say a mechanical component that can interact with its environment and learn from it. So that's an artificial intelligence um, classification. Now, if I have to look at machine learning, they are the models that actually run inside the mechanism. They are the uh, mathematical uh, models of the, tra uh, the training models that I'm running on, um, let's say, and basic neural networks, all of these help in figuring out and helping the AI interact with this domain. Um, what would be the next one? Great, so what is the effect of quantum computing? Uh, this is a good question. So first, I'm not an expert in quantum computing. So uh, I would say my understanding of uh, what I know of quantum computing is you can actually have all different states of rest and uh, unrest on the same cell. It can hold uh, multiple states of matter, right? Uh, which means I do not need too much free space and it increases the capacity of a small uh, area of a chip holding in memory and value. Uh, and I think how that's going to play into the future is pretty straightforward in terms of in, in knowing that the model's capacity to store information is going to increase rapidly. So if supposing I have a quantum computer that's going to be as accessible as a PC or a mobile phone, it simply means I have my data stored in very closely to my system. And I don't have to have my data being scraped from multiple websites and various data centers uh, to process the data and then understand how much the model can train it and what is the outcome going to be. So uh, if quantum computing is going to become very uh, growing in the future and part of everyone's simple reality, like the, like our mobile phones, then it's highly possible that computers and data and the training of you know data is going to be extremely extremely easy and fast. Okay, so okay, what's the next question? Um, How Apache Spark, Java, and Scala based systems are changing data science scenario. Why is it not being implemented much yet in the industry? Okay, so there's a, there are different applications, right? Uh, it's, it's, you cannot say that these are not being implemented in the industry at all. Um, it's, it's just that uh, mostly a lot of these uh, are not being tested a lot in the hiring process. I would say, and most of the companies are looking for people to be filled in at a stage where they're using a lot more visualization, a lot more of web uh, data scraping through SQL and query. Uh, and I'm pretty sure all of this is being used quite a lot inside an organization. So they probably aren't expecting you to hold this amount of knowledge uh, coming into the organization. So if most of you are starting out right now, since I feel I'm addressing a lot more of um, uh, in the academic audience, I would say, um, it's not necessarily to completely focus on those tech, uh, technical stuff. Make sure you know a lot more of visualization, uh, data uh, modeling, analysis, and stuff like that. Okay, move to the next one. What is the basis of deciding the number of neurons in each layer? Sure. So um, there is no specific way of deciding it. So when I talked about image processing, um, the previous example, uh, if I can go back to the 
slide and go back. Okay, I can go back. Okay, so there's no specific way in which we can actually uh, determine the number of uh, neurons in each layer. So each of these neurons are actually random. Uh, and the first layer, which has 784 here, he decided to have 784 here because there are 784 pixels uh, in that space that holds the number. And he decided each pixel to be represented in the first layer, saying that, okay, wherever the light is on in that pixel with white color, I'm going to make those specific pixels bright and the rest of them dark. So they will hold a value one and the rest of them will hold a value of zero. So he, this is his way of training the model around an image classification. And there are multiple ways we can do this with our own logic. But the logic of giving weight, weights and backpropagating does not change. That's the typical structure of how a neural network is established. Um, so if you're asking me, are, how do we determine number of neurons in each layer? It's random. I would choose, six, he, he chose uh, 784, next has 16, and the next has 16. Um, this can be even 32, 64, uh, 1, 0, or 100. And of course, we see that there's a certain optimal number that gives us better values. A faster model, it doesn't take too much time. At the same time, we get a good result. Sure. So next question would be, um, how data science differs from big data and data analytics? OK, so uh, data science is this all encompassing, encompassing um, field, right? It does not have, uh, it's, it's, if you're a data scientist, if you know how to run ML models, and you're a data scientist, uh, basically because you try and understand this entire domain, it's a knowledge of using data and deriving some information from data and organizing this data. So it's, an, it, it's, it's a broader term. And big data is it's just a phenomenon. It's, it's, it's somebody like a statistician coined saying, hey, there's something called big data because people are generating a lot of data in the market. So if you say you know big data, it just means you know how to handle the situation of big data, which is very different from handling situation of uh, training models and stuff like that. They are actually uh, a process that come after knowing how to handle big data. Handling big data means you need to uh, know how to scrape data from various networks of computers, which are connected across different parts of the world. Sometimes uh, you need to know how to uh, treat data, which is constantly flowing in. Uh, how do I design and optimize my tables and inferences in such a fashion that um, the quickest, the quickest uh, searching has to maybe pop up uh, from the nearest computer that stores memory. And the computer that's storing this memory shouldn't be too far from the person who's searching for it and things like that. So big data is a very different field that way. Data analytics is nothing but analyzing data. It's a statistical way of uh, using it. It basically means you um, put graphs, charts, and error analysis, correlations, uh, ANOVA, which is another technique, analysis of variance, uh, and all of this in the background that you do with analyzing, analyzing data, that is data analytics. So don't get confused with all of these terms. Data science is a broader field. Uh, machine learning. Then you have uh, you know AI and everything else. Um, and deep learning, machine learning are all kind of interrelated. So you, you just basically remember data science. And that would probably do. Um, Are there uh, are there scopes of solving environmental problems and increasing sustainability with the use of data science? Of course, um, data science is being helping a lot with uh, keeping human beings safe. Um, I think climate change predictions saying that uh, we'll have a certain amount of um, water shortage in this period of time, uh, all of this can be derived from simulation. Just the way you saw simulations being made out of people moving between a grocery store in multiple locations, the same thing can be achieved by actually running people, uh, let's say through, let's say there's a pond and there's a lot of people constantly polluting it. You can run a simulation bar percentage uh, of how much it can happen and then showing people how uh, this can actually affect the water shortage, create water shortages or how uh, simulating, like maybe let's say connecting to dams, how it's going to help, uh, how much water is consum consumed on an everyday basis. Uh, environmentally has great scope. Uh, we can also analyze how winds are moving, right? How are people able to say 
global warming is going to impact us quite a bit in, in 2020s in the next in, in, in the next decade we have globally rising by 4 degrees and all of these predictions are coming because of climate science and if we don't listen uh, even then i think that's a very serious issue so data science is already helping a lot of these decisions so uh, in terms of how data science is helping lower the rate of solving pandemic and medical issues um is isn't it already the scenario that uh, you know most of us realize we need to be quarantined uh, we should not move outside uh, and people are listening also because of data science like i said um you know maybe our ancestors were smart i mean there are some people probably who never questioned right they were probably never asking too many questions and they knew if they were sick they just had to be home they should not talk to people they should be in isolation and we are not a generation that listens to all of that um data science is definitely something like a tool uh, to tell you that hey um if this is going to happen if you don't do this um this is my prediction so please listen um and that and i think a lot of people are actually listening to um forecasts they're actually able to observe trends uh, they're able to trust how data is moving uh, even now if you go look at the website uh, you can actually see the count of a uh, number of corona cases you can just type a search in google and you'll get live updates um maybe with a accuracy of around 90% i should say or or 80% um you can actually predict uh, what if the rate is correct or not um it's able to give people a prediction of which regions are more susceptible is it correlated with temperatures um is it, uh, which which age group of people are actually having issues and all of these reasons do we have time for more questions or uh, do you want to end the session so you can take up the last question or right, okay okay um just trying to filter out a question which is probably pretty important to answer out okay so uh, someone asked me what is the biggest uh, data set that you have processed and how did i process it and what were the results so uh, as i gave you a live example um, i i'm doing two projects the biggest data set i processed is around 10 million rows um, and it came up to about uh, about 6 6 gb 7 gb of data um, so we had to directly use um, uh and you know we tried to take it off the google cloud uh we had to use google cloud analytics uh and try to incorporate that in jupyter notebook and run the jupyter notebook basically from there and visualize data from python and i also connected my tableau server to it uh that's exactly how i got certain models from my um um I'm trying to see if i can show you the project yeah so that's exactly how i got certain outputs here um basically from my analysis in the airport section um so you can use uh, these two scenarios pretty well um i can't disclose more about exact result because i can't talk to you about it because of um, my nda for non disclosure but um yeah uh, feel free to ask me more questions uh, like i said i'm just leaving my um contact here for all of you uh, feel free to reach out on all these portals and i'll be happy to interact and maybe jam a few discussions on data science i'm also pretty passionate about product management it's another field that's coming up um i'm pretty experienced in that domain uh, feel free to ask me more about it and i'll be happy to discuss and with that i'll just hand it over to the moderators thank you all thank you sir first of all i would like to thank venkat raju sir for giving his valuable time to deliver such informative session on data analytics and taking us through the topic from a basic to an intermediate level I'm sure it would help many of us our guests present here in the field of data analytics. So we definitely look forward to have you with us in the near future, and uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Now I would like to call the uh, Dr. Darshan Mohanty, so branch branch council, to say a few words. Okay. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. Sir. Venkat Raju sir for the informative session. It surely help everyone learn something new. I thank our principal, Dr. Indrajit Patel sir, for supporting us, and today our host, Himan Sir Thakur, along with the moderators of the day, Mr. Jay Prajapati and Mr. Jilraj Mehra, 
for handling everything during the session to make it effective. I would like to thank Team IEEE BBM for organizing this event and all the participants without whom we would not be able to spread the knowledge. I hope everyone enjoyed the session and we will meet soon again in our next session today. Today our next session at 5 p.m. Uh, by Mr. Andrevich from Russia, the session on machine learning for solar energy forecasting. So stay safe and stay home, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And before ending this session, I'd like to remind everyone about our upcoming flagship event, Blogathon, a national level blog writing competition with the topic is not limited to only technical blogs, but also you can write blogs on non-tech aspects of the world. And yes, why not? You can also write a blog about what you have learned today in the session and build your ideas on it. So kindly go ahead and register as soon as possible. Details are given in the chat box. Thank you, Venkat, sir, for giving your uh, sharing your knowledge. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. See you in the next session.